Gone. Freedom of speech in your country is even more under assault than freedom of speech in our country back home. We still have a First Amendment. You guys have hate speech laws. You have a criminal code of Canada advocating for penalties of up to two years in prison for inciting hatred against an identifiable group, which is insanity, since obviously there is no great legal definition of any of these terms. They are all far too broad. As a lawyer, Bill C-16 is an abomination. Bill C-16... <laughs> which the sponsors of the bill themselves, some of them have said, that it really shouldn't be a problem because after all, if you make a mistake and mislabel a transgender person, that's okay. But if you do it intentionally, then you can be prosecuted under Bill C-16. I mean, this is a violation of basic free speech principles. It's also a basic violation of science. And we have now come to the point for the left where science itself is an obstacle to their agenda. And that's why you see on campus Professor Peterson being ripped up and down by University of Toronto for failing to properly abide by the idiotic strictures of an anti-scientific program that denies biology in favor of subjective self-measurement. Okay, you see Professor Peterson receiving a letter from the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Science and the Vice Provost for Faculty and Academic Life stating that his refusal to call men women is, quote, contrary to the rights of those persons to equal treatment without discrimination based on their gender identity and gender expression. And they called Professor Peterson's decision to abide by biology unacceptable, emotionally disturbing and painful for some students. And they threatened him with violating the Ontario Human Rights Code. Now, it is worthwhile mentioning that when it comes to the sort of speech codes that are used up here and are used on your campuses, they only seem to apply to certain groups in the hierarchy of victimhood. So Jews seem to be left out of this particular situation. Over at York, anti-Semitic propaganda has become all the rage with boycott, divestment and sanctions endorsed by multiple professors. BDS is of course a pure form of anti-Semitism, unwatered down and undiluted despite all attempts to mask it. The York Federation of Students has formed an official alliance with the Students Against Israeli Apartheid and there is, of course, the mural at the Student Center that showed a Palestinian man holding rocks and gazing at a Jewish settlement. According to B'day Brith, high school students who visited York were told they didn't understand victimhood because they were Jewish. All of this stuff is okay. <laughs> but if you say that a man is a man and a woman is a woman, and you can't magically change from one to the other, you can't just pop a man into the woman machine and they come out like a star-bellied sneech from Dr. Seuss, <laughs> if you say that, then all of a sudden you're violating hate speech rules in this country and on your campuses. None of this is rare in America either, obviously. America's college campuses are experiencing exactly the same thing. There is, fortunately in the United States, still a legal framework under which you're allowed to say essentially what you want. We'll see how long that lasts, but that seems to be a pretty strong bipartisan tradition in the United States. But on campus, that tradition has gone the way of the dodo bird. The idea that you get to say what you want and think what you want, uh, that no longer applies on America's college campuses. And that's because America's college campuses have one abiding goal. And so does the left more broadly, that college campuses are sort of just the tip of the spear. That abiding goal is equality of outcome, not equality of rights, not equal access to opportunity, equality of outcome. That's all that matters. All that matters is that we all end up in the same place. If somebody on the left sees somebody with $5 and sees somebody with $1 in the same room, they immediately assume the person with $5 had best give a couple of bucks to the guy with $1 because he clearly somehow stole from him. Right? Equality of outcome is all that matters. Now, America's founding fathers believed in equality of rights. They believed that we are all born equal in our rights, that God has provided us with certain inalienable rights that we can't give away, and that no one else has a right to impede upon. But that's not how the left thinks. The left thinks in terms of this equality of outcome. And the problem is the real world doesn't provide equality of outcome, because number one, we all start with different capacities. Right? Some of us are smart, some of us are stupid, some of us are tall, some of us are short, some of us have logic, some of us are protesters at college campuses. <laughs> We're not all going to end up in the same place. We choose different career paths. We make different decisions about our lives. We work non-equally hard. And so what the left has decided that is that if they can't achieve economic equality, they tried that for a century and it resulted in 100 million people dead. So they said, okay, you know, we'll put that to the side for the moment. We'll come back later with like stupid Bernie Sanders like Justin Trudeau and Bernie Sanders himself. <laughs> And we'll talk income inequality, and then we'll talk about social democracy, and then eventually we'll sort of start inching our way back toward the confiscation of wealth at point of gun. But while we do that, 
in the short term, at least we should have equality of feelings. And that we can do immediately. We can ensure equality of feelings right now. If we can't all feel equal in our achievements, then we can at least all feel equal when it comes to our feeling of victimhood at the hands of Western civilization. And the best way to do this is to set up the hierarchy of intersectionality. And a bunch of people have talked about this tonight, but they're really, you know, people say that it's hard to distinguish what that hierarchy is. It's not hard at all. We all know it, right? I mean, if you're on a college campus, if you're living in a leftist area, you know what the hierarchy of intersectionality is. You know, the folks whose opinions mean more at the very top are the LGBT folks. And then below that are, this is the United States version anyway, right below that are black folks, and then Hispanic folks and Native American folks, and then women, and then Asian folks, and then Jews, and then straight white guys. Right? That's basically the hierarchy of intersectionality. And the thing is that your opinion doesn't matter. All that matters is where you are on this hierarchy of intersectionality, unless you are a right-winger. Then you are not even human and we don't pay attention to your opinions. But everybody else, we will accept your opinion so long as you accept the hierarchy. So if you're a straight white male and you accept that your opinion is of no value compared to anyone else on earth, then you get to be part of the club. And what's great about this is that you can tell just by looking at someone, I mean, it's a little racist, kind of sexist and a little bit classist and everything, but you know, you can tell just by looking at someone, just by just looking at them, how valuable their opinion is going to be. It doesn't matter how stupid it is. We know how valuable their opinion is going to be. In fact, if we could somehow find an LGBT, a transgender, male, lesbian, half Native American, half black, a quarter Mexican, and a little person with a disability, then that person would be able to just rule us. We could end democracy right now. This person would immediately become king or queen. I don't want to be gender specific. And this would be, and, and this would be the final, we can end, no more voting, no more debate. This person has the ultimate opinion because this is the ultimate victim of this evil Western civilization that must be torn down piece by piece. And the bargain for people is pretty simple. You get to feel good about yourself even if you haven't done anything in your life. You get to feel that all of your failures are the result of a society that's seeking to victimize you. Grab a chisel and hammer away. You're part of the coalition that's going to tear down this evil civilization that has victimized you. Now, never mind that all of this is sheer bullshit. Right? Never mind that none of this makes any sense. Never mind that when people talk about white privilege, in the United States it doesn't make sense for a variety of reasons, including the fact that the majority of people on welfare in the United States are white, including the fact that the people with the highest average household in income in the United States are Asian, which is weird. I mean, like, Koreans didn't write the Constitution. Right? So is it, is it Korean privilege that's causing all of this in the United States, or is it just possible that we have a free system and people who work really hard do really well in the United States under a free system. None of it makes any sense, but it makes everybody feel really good. And that feeling of victimhood is empowering to people. It's not empowering them to do anything useful. It doesn't empower them to work harder, because in fact, if they work hard and they succeed, they've actually undermined their entire argument. If they work hard and they succeed under this, this cruel, oppressive system that was supposed to keep them down, then how do they make the argument it's a cruel, oppressive system that was supposed to keep them down? It makes it kind of difficult. So it, but it does give them a feeling of achievement just for being there. And the way that they protect this is by preventing anyone else from thinking or speaking. And so they use language like white privilege, and then they use the microaggression culture. Now, the microaggression culture is specifically designed to make people into mewling babies. That's what microaggression culture is designed to do. So microaggressions, as you all know, because most of you are college students, microaggressions are this idiotic notion that if someone says something to you that you find insulting, mind you, it doesn't have to actually be insulting, but you find it insulting, subjectively, right? If you find it insulting, then you have been microaggressed. Something deeply evil has been done to you, and you have every right to be upset and angry and blame the system and cry about it, right? That's what micro... And we have to ban them. We have to, we have to do everything we can to wipe that out of people. We have to have diversity training so that people must never speak. We become like a monastery from the 14th century. You just sit around and you stare at each other. But it's all pretty because it's ethnically diverse, but it's really quiet. That's what microaggression culture is designed to do. These small actions or word choices, as a Jonathan Haidt over at The Atlantic says, that seem on their face to have no malicious intent, but that are thought of as a kind of violence nonetheless. Now, what's dangerous about this is not just the attempt to silence, it's the language itself. So microaggression is not just something insulting. When I was growing up, we didn't have this stupidity. I'm not that much older than you guys, but we didn't have this stupidity even 10 years before you were born. You know, we just used to call it an insult. And then we were told to grow up because people insult each other. But the microaggression language 
is different because microaggression language suggests that there is an actual aggression taking place. Something aggressive has been done to you. Never mind that it wasn't purposeful. Never mind it wasn't even accident. Never mind maybe never even happened. The bottom line is something aggressive has been done to you. And you know what aggression calls for? It calls for, it calls for an aggressive response. It calls for you to shut down debate. It calls for you to storm stages. It calls for you to get violent with people. And so things that are completely and utterly anodyne, right? if you say something like, I'm colorblind to somebody, this is a microaggression because how could you not acknowledge your own white privilege? I'm colorblind actually means you're racist. Right? If you use he and she, right? this is offensive to transgender people because you're not using made-up words like she and gjubi. Right? <laughs> These are microaggressions because even if you legitimately didn't know the sex of the person you're talking to, or you did know the sex, but you didn't know what, in, like you're meeting the person for the first time, you have no idea what in their own mind they are. If you do that, then it's a microaggression on a cosmic scale. And this calls for aggression. Now, and this has actually resulted in violence, not just in attempts to shut down speeches you know, by, by somebody who I really dislike but has every right to speak, Milo Yiannopoulos at Berkeley, uh, or, um, or attempts to shut me down at uh, DePaul University or at University of Wisconsin or at Cal State LA. Uh, it, it's, it's getting to the point where it's, result, it, it's bleeding up from the university level higher up into sort of the leftist, into the leftist groupthink.